Okay, so I'll shift the gear a little bit and go to larger scales and start talking about cosmology. So I was asked to talk about Planck and the future observational cosmology and I have to start with a warning. I'm not a member of the Planck team, so I have no inside information. But that also means that I'm free to speak and say whatever I want. So the Planck people always when they give talks, they have to be extraordinarily careful not to give any secrets away. So I have, I have no secrets, so I can give away everything I have. So what is Planck? So the Planck is, of course, very successful. He's a mission launched in 2009, and there's short the movie starting here showing how Planck operates. Uh, so it's scanning the sky, so it's scanning the microwave background. And this is at an unprecedented resolution. So never done before. This resolution is about three times better than the American satellite WMAP, which completed its mission about 10 years ago, or started its mission 10 years ago. And it uses nine frequencies at 30 to 857 gigahertz. So it observes the microwave background in nine frequencies using this type of scanning technology. And the first data release uh, of Planck was in last, uh, last year, in March 2013. There will be a next data release in October 2014, I've been told. This has been pushed back and back and back. It was initially uh, supposed to be about March 2014, but it's moving back. And then there will be a uh, final data release towards the end of 2015. So Planck has already stopped taking data. So Planck was turned off uh, in uh, uh, October 2013, roughly, so half a year or more or so ago. So it's not taking any more data, but they're still analyzing the data. And the key thing here is to remember the title said uh, Legacy of Planck. And actually, this talk is too early. We cannot really talk about the legacy of Planck because not all of the data and analysis has really been presented. So instead, this will really be more of a midterm review of Planck, so what we know at this moment of Planck, and also some thoughts then on the future directions of observational cosmology. So we are first in the present, and then towards the end of the talk, I will go to the future. So how does the microwave sky look for Planck? So this is a sky as seen by Planck in these nine different frequency bands. And you see this band in the middle? That's the Milky Way. That's the part we are not interested in. Uh, at least the cosmologists are not interested in that. Of course, there are lots of astrophysicists who are mainly interested in that part. And you see at uh, different frequencies, so the CMB is the thing, the cosmic wave background is the thing you see in the background. So here, the low frequencies, you see it much better, whereas the higher frequencies, you see it much worse. Uh, you see more, more of the, the uh, foreground stuff, and this is dust and synchrotron emission in, in the Milky Way, which is in the front. But the key thing with Planck here is that it observes in these nine different frequencies. Because without this, it's very, very difficult to do a foreground, or it's impossible to do a proper foreground reduction. And any results you get for cosmology are only as good as your foreground reduction model. If you're unable to remove the Milky Way properly, you will not do proper cosmology. This will be important a bit later. Remember, Planck has nine frequencies, and that's very important. Then look at the main results. So this is the cosmic microwave background. And uh, Hannah Kurkisuoni, who's the PI of the Finnish uh, contribution, uh, Finnish participation, is always a bit unhappy with this image because it shows the Milky Way in the middle. So it actually highlights the part of the sky where uh, Planck uh, where does the worst job because the Milky Way being the, in, in the front. So you can actually see here that some part here of this image is not real data because they were not able to completely remove the Milky Way there. So this is the fluctuations. So what this actually shows. This has the measured temperature of the CMB, which today you can accurately measure is 2.72548. And the fluctuations, the red uh, and the blue parts, are a temperature fluctuations of the order of 10 to the minus 5. So it's very, very uniform temperature with the differences being 10 to the minus 5. But these differences are very important. That's why we are in this room. Without these differences, there would be no galaxies, no stars, no structure in the universe. That's the, that's the reason we are here. We need this kind of structure. And here you can then show the same thing as a power spectrum. So basically you take the data from there, put the power spectrum, uh, and then you usually use this multiple moment, L's. Important thing here to remember is that small L's means very large scales, and very large L's here mean very small scales. This is the angular scale. So then you can see that there is this big peak in the power spectrum at the largest fluctuations on the scales of one degree. And there you see the model and the data points and it works extremely well, especially here at large L's, so at small scales, but at lower L's, uh, there's some uh, discrepancy still. And so what is this figure actually showing? It's essentially sh showing sound waves in the primordial plasma. 
So the universe is 380,000 years old. This is redshift 1,100. Uh, and then you see these fluctuating sound waves in this plasma. So it's kind of relatively simple physics. Sound waves in a plasma. And how you do cosmology with this is that from theory we can calculate the physical sizes of these sound waves. How large should the sound waves be? This is the first sound wave, uh, maximum compression, then you have uh, the opposite, and then you have overtones, and you see these sound waves here. So we can calculate how large this should be in physical size, if you, if you like, in kilometers, and then we look at the sky. How large should they appear to be? What's the angular sky, the size? And from that we can get a distance to the last, scale, uh, the last scattering surface. So it's very simple geometric distance. And this is one way of, of deriving cosmological parameters from the CMB. There's huge amount of information in this image. So you can calculate all kinds of different cosmological parameters. And how it actually is done is that you run millions and millions of models with different parameters, Monte Carlo models, and you find and try to find the right, right model. But it's not so simple always because uh, you have to kind of fix all of the parameters at the same time. So it's difficult to always find a completely unique solution. So what are the parameters we want to find out? So the standard lambda CDM model. So lambda CDM means a dark energy model with cold dark matter. This can be characterized, the standard vanilla model can be characterized by six parameters if we assume that the universe is flat, meaning that the total <coughs> density equals the critical density and that the dark energy, which we know nothing about, is described by vacuum energy. That's the assumption in the lambda CDM model. So the parameters for this model First, omega baryon. This is the density parameter of baryonic matter. So this is the normal matter we know. It's about 4.9%. Uh, then we have the density <coughs> parameter of cold dark matter. So how much cold dark <coughs> matter we have in the universe. And then omega lambda, the density parameter of dark energy. Then there are three other parameters. The first one called tau. This is the optical depth to the last scattering surface. So this is the optical depth to the, uh, depth to the CMB. And this depends on the fraction of the CMB photons that are scattered from interstellar electrons on the way from the CMB to us. And actually when Planck derived this result, uh, he used polarization data from WMAPS. WMAP is an earlier satellite which also published some polarization data. Planck has measured the polarization but has not published any of his polarization data yet. And we'll come back to that soon. Then there are two final parameters. This NS, which is the power index of, of the primordial scalar density perturbations. So it tells what the index of, of the perturbations is. If n1, it would mean scale invariant, and then you have an amplitude, which describes how large the perturbations are. So if they are 10 to the minus 5, or the 10 to the minus 3, or 10 to the minus 7, depending on what kind of structure you get. So these are the six simple parameters of the lambda CDM model. And this is what Planck found. This is the Planck new cosmology. So this is the new truth, this, the, the new absolute truth that always changes a few years when we get the new parameters. So you see here, many of the times they are combined with the little h here. So little h is the Hubble constant, which tells you about the expansion uh, velocity of the, of the universe. Uh, and actually little h is in units of 100 kilometers per second per megaparsec. So little h here would be 0 .6, 0 0.674. Uh, and here you see, this is Planck alone. Then you can combine Planck with WMAP, so this previous satellite, which has some polarization data. Then you can also uh, combine Planck with uh, High L, so this means uh, ground-based uh, telescopes that are able to measure the CMB at very, very small scales, at even higher resolution than Planck. And then there's something called uh, baryonic acoustic oscillations. We'll get back to that soon. So there's combinations of different data sets. You get slightly different parameters. But the key things here, if you compare to previous results, so when the data was released uh, one year ago, oh well, in March last year, the first people were very disappointed because there's nothing new, but there were slight differences. So for example, Planck found now that the Hubble constant is slightly smaller. So the expansion rate of the universe is slightly slower than before. And also that the age of the universe was slightly different. And you needed more dark matter and less dark energy. But still, the differences to before are not huge. So, so before, this, this number was maybe 0 0.28, and now it's 0 0.314. So there's still some rumors, uh, still some room to change these parameters. And then look at the summary of the Planck results. So here is before Planck, and this is after Planck, just showing the dark matter, baryonic matter, and dark energy. So the dark energy went down a little bit, the dark matter went a little bit up with Planck. So what was remarkable about the Planck March 2030 30 data release was that it found no evidence for anything beyond the standard lambda CDM model. So what, that, what does that mean? 
He found no primordial non-Gaussianity, no isoc curvature modes, these are all exotic physics, no primordial gravitational waves, no running of the spectral index, meaning that the spectral, spectral index is fixed, doesn't change with scales, no dark radiation, which means extra types of neutrinos, no curvature, so it's found flat, and no uh, cosmic strains. So this was everything that theoret theoreticians were hoping for, and they found nothing, nothing of this. So they only found confirmed at extremely high accuracy this standard lambda CDM model. And that's what's disappointing, because if you find something, it's disappointing because we don't <coughs> understand the current model. We don't know what the vacuum energy is. So it would be much more exciting to find something else. So what it found, instead Planck found everything predicted by the standard lambda CDM model, so this means that you saw very clearly lensing of the cosmic background at the 25 sigma level. First detections of non-Gaussianity due to lensing, so not primordial non-Gaussianity, but lensing, foreground structures, lensing uh, uh, and cosmic infrared background correlation. And we also saw the effect of our mo motion with respect to the CMB at higher multiples than just the dipole. So these all are things expected in the lambda CDM model that were found. But there was something interesting as well. So Planck did also discover, as of yet, unexplained anomalies in the CMB at large scales. So the very large scales, a small L, the, the lambda C the model doesn't fully fit the data points. But this is kind of a two sigma effect, so it's not something people lose sleep over. But still, I was, I was actually live on the news, and they asked me, is another te universe colliding with our present universe at the moment? Difficult question to answer in a live, live news, news show. But uh, anyway, they, they read it somewhere. So uh, the key thing is that the small scale structure, large L, is very, very, very well fit by lambda CDM. So that constrains very strongly the, the larger scale. So you have no room there to wiggle around because the small scale, large L, is very well fit by standard lambda CDM. Then to the more exciting stuff. So I will, I will also talk about not only Planck, but about the things that's been uh, since March been like this new uh, earthquake in cosmology. So people really been excited about this. So a little bit background first. So the CMB, now we only talked about the temperature fluctuation in the CMB. It can also be uh, polarized. So the emission can be polarized and depending on the rel relative different directions, you have something called density perturbations or then gravitational wave perturbations. And cosmologists use the term scalar and tensor perturbations. And this can then give rise, density perturbations can give rise to only primordial E-mode polarization. So E-mode is this type of polarization. Uh, uh, and then you have another type of polarization called B-mode. And this B-mode is the important thing because this can also be uh, uh, produced by gravitational wave <coughs> perturbations in the early universe. So gravitational wave fluctuations in the early universe can produce this B-mode. And this is the holy grail of CMB cosmology. So this plot here shows how weak this BB mode is. So, so these are the temperature fluctuations, and then you go down. The EE mode have been seen. Actually, the BB mode has been seen because at, la at larger Ls, at small scales, some of this BB mode can be produced by gravitational lensing by foreground structures. So this has been detected, of course, and this and this. But this was the holy grail. Do we find BB modes uh, at these scales, so about one degree scale, L100? Uh, because that would be a signature of quantum fluctuations of, of the metric, so gravitational quantum fluctuations of the metric during inflation. And then, uh, before we go on there, we talk about inflation. <coughs> so inflation is this uh, uh, period of time in the very beginning uh, where uh, the universe was expanding at an accelerated rate. So this uh, thought to happen, 10, uh, 10 to the minus 36, 10 to the minus 32 seconds after the Big Bang, driven by a scalar field, during which the universe expanded by a factor of at least e to the power 50 to 60. Superluminal expansion, extreme expansion. This idea was presented in the early 1980s by Alan Gaffin and Andre Linda. And many things have been confirmed in, in the cosmological model seem to support the inflation, but the smoking gun is still kind of missing a little bit. So it says that the universe should be flat to a very high degree of precision. It's easy to understand if you have arbitrary geometry and you blow up this to enormous sizes, the geometry will be flat. The same thing if I measure distances on this table, I don't need to take into account the curvature of the Earth because the distance is so small. The same idea. Uh, also that the, scale, the per density perturbation <coughs> should be almost scale invariant, but not quite. So this NS, this, this index should be close to one, but slightly below one. 
And that's also now confirmed by Planck to, to 10 sigma already. It cannot be 1 anymore. It has to be just below 1. And also that the running of the spectral index should be very small. And then the inflationary model also predicts that there should be primordial gravitational waves, turns to from quantum fluctuations of the space-time during the inflationary epoch. It's a general prediction that these gravitational waves should be there, but the strength of these waves depends on the infl inflationary model. And I have to say that there are about two, three hundred different models of inflation. So, so it's not, it's a family of models. But the idea is general. And the strength of the perturbations are quantified by something called R, which is simply like a tensor to scalar ratio. So how strong are the tensor perturbations compared to scalar ratios? And using this, you can set the energy scale for inflation. So that's important. Then if for first time you would have any kind of evidence of physics at a scale close to the Planck scale. Because we already know this, this uh, amplitude we know, so we need to measure this R. And Planck found that R has to be below 0.11. That was the Planck result. They did not find it, but they said it must be smaller than 0.11. That was the Planck result. Uh, then in March came the earthquake. So this is uh, March this year, BICEP 2. <coughs> a collaboration led from Harvard have a dedicated telescope on the South Pole measuring polarization of the CMB. And they're measuring not whole sky like Planck, they're measuring a very small region of the sky with a very dedicated mission that optimized polarization measurements. And they found their result is that the primordial gravitational waves is a very strong signal. This was a shocking strong signal. So R 0 0.2. That's the result they say. Although Planck said that upper limit is 0 0.11. Clearly these are in conflict with each other. And you have to remember now the difference here. Bicep 2 concentrated on a very small patch of the sky in one single frequency. Key thing, one single frequency, 150 gigahertz. They have no other frequencies but this frequency. And then the first question everyone asks, what about foregrounds? Did you do a proper job with the foregrounds? So no one is disputing the fact that they found something. The question is, is the signal cosmological or not? And we'll come back to that soon. So this is the signal they show, the E signal and the B signal. So this is a paper that received about 100 citations per week since it's been published, so it's, it's, it's been well received. But they did not really do a very good foreground separation. And one reason was that they were waiting for Planck results which were not published. Uh, but this instrument was designed to minimize polarization and it's by a group, big group led from Harvard who were the first one to also find the, the B signal at larger multiples, so they're not, it's not a group of amateurs, it's a very well known strong group, so people took it very seriously of course. And they made first, these discoveries presented at a big Harvard press conference, many people tried to watch this, but of course the server failed, <coughs> it was so exciting, there was huge enthusiasm, and everyone said, okay, now it's, now it's a question of years, so when, when you will get the Nobel Prize. So everyone said, this is clear, that's what we've been looking for, everything is fine. But now things have turned a little bit sour here. So there's been lots of rumors. And you have to be honest, most of the rumors are originating from Princeton. And, and Princeton is well known to have uh, its battles with Harvard. So they have a big CMB group as well in Princeton. And they now state, and their blogs actually saying all kinds of rumors, saying that the signal might be mostly or all due to foreground polarization in the Milky Way. So one of the uh, so let's say most evil rumors say that what the BICEP2 did, a group did this, that they took a talk by Planck's, uh, Planck scientists from a PowerPoint, sl PowerPoint slide, measured the level of foreground uh, dust from the slide using some kind of color scales. So these are rumors. I'm not saying these are facts, but these are very, very evil rumors started. So BICEP2 measurement is this. So they show that they really actually hit the, hit the measurement whereas this is here than the foreground, uh, previous measurements. <coughs> and, but then, papers came. This is the region BICEP2 is measuring. These are loops, radio loops in the Milky Way from massive star-forming regions. One of the loops, which has lots of polarized foreground emission, goes straight through this region. Did they really account for that? Planck came out with a dust map just a few weeks ago. Note which area is not shown in this dust map. So Planck is not showing the area where BICEP2 made this measurement. I was told by scientists that uh, the reason for this is that this was made much before the BICEP2 announcement. But you can believe what you want. Uh, still, Planck has a very uh, detailed dust map here, foreground emission, and they're not showing the results. And just watching the Planck scientists here in Helsinki, 
first there uh, you could see that they were shocked, not unhappy, they were very unhappy, but now they're smiling more and more as time goes on. So this is clearly some kind of indication that Planck still has some kind of a trump card in its, its, its back. So all these issues should be resolved in October uh, when Planck then releases the next data set. Because then they should tell us what the foreground emission is and what polarization signal Planck finds. But one key thing is that Planck is not optimized for the polarization measurement. So this is a very difficult technical issue for Planck to try to do. So bicep two was only only job for bicep two was to measure this polarization signal. Planck was not optimized for this. So so that's the reason why they did not publish the results already a year ago because they they had they weren't able to find a solution they would believe. So they didn't want to go prematurely publishing something. Uh, so we have to wait. So it's very much jury is out. And then you have to remember always when these big discoveries, people are now fighting for the Nobel Prize. So they have to come into the right position. So if the Princeton crowd gets enough of doubt over the Harvard measurement, <coughs> maybe th there's lots of politics involved here as well, which I can talk about because I know nothing about it. Okay, so Planck is optimized for CMB temperature measurements, and the correction for polarization systematics is very demanding. Let's go to the next thing now. So now, now we leave Planck behind, and we start, talk start talking about the future. So what is the future in observational cosmology? So I think it's very much to do with large-scale surveys <coughs> of galaxies. And the US, Americans do every 10 years or so, they do a decadal survey where they put everything in astronomy uh, prioritized and say, what are the main missions Americans should put money into in the following 10, 15, 20 years? So they did this in 2010, and the top priorities for the coming decades in space-based mission was something called a wide field infrared survey telescope and the ground base was called large synoptic survey telescope so both number ones were large survey telescopes so that was the number one for both space and ground based and the main one of the main survey goals and one of the reasons is with these survey telescopes you can do huge amounts of different science you can do exoplanets you can do ground dwarfs stellar structure milky way evolution galaxy evolution cosmology so it's very versatile instead of being very targeted mission. So one of the main goals is mapping of galaxies out to high redshift, studying dark constituents of the universe. So this is dark matter and dark energy. And there's one important thing here to remember that when you talk about what is the most successful telescope in the world as measured by cit citations, it's not the Hubble Space Telescope, which you would think it is. It's actually the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is a very small 2.5 meter telescope. The same size as the Nordic Optical Telescope. The mirror has the same size. But this is a dedicated survey telescope. And what it done, it started operation in uh, 2000, 2001, and its operation was just to measure, uh, data set includes 500 million photometric observations with over 1 million spectra. And here's an example of the local universe, so this large scale structure. And this telescope has also discovered dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way, numbers of brown dwarfs, high redshift quasars, multitude, multitude of things. And most of the papers are not written by the Sloan team, it's written by others who use the Sloan data because they made it publicly available. So this has been a huge success. So this is one of the reasons, the drivers behind this survey kind of telescopes now being the, the hot thing in astronomy. So there's one survey telescope that I already mentioned, Euclid. So Euclid is, I have to show the new logo, we got an email last week that we have to show it. Uh, so this is Euclid telescope that's been approved by ESA. So this is the M-class mission that will be launched in 2020. Euclid has a 1.2 meter mirror, which is not a huge mirror if you compare it to Hubble or, or the JWST, which will have a much larger mirror. But it's a very wide, uh, uh, half, half a square degree field of view. And it, Euclid is equipped with a visual imager and a near infrared spectrometer <coughs> and photometer. So it will, this mission is, is the next cosmological mission and it will be a much more astronomical mission than Planck, because this mission will image galaxies. That's basically what it does. It takes photographs of galaxies and spectrum. The goal is to image 1.5 billion galaxies and take a spectrum of 50 million galaxies up to redshift 2. So redshift 2 means that this will study the past 10 billion years of the universe. Planck was concentrating at the very high redshifts. This will look at the rest of the universe, pretty much, 10 billion years. So there are more than 1,000 scientists involved and about 15 to 20 from Finland the PI is Hanno Burkisuoni here from university, and the PI institution is University of Helsinki, but there's also scientists from Turku and Yvaskula involved in this mission. Some of them are here in the room. 
Uh, and scientific ob uh, uh, objectives include studying the evolution of dark energy and mapping the dark matter distribution in the universe. So these are the big questions, so dark energy. Dark energy is an excellent uh, research topic because the American uh, Department of Energy is funding this as well because they think there will be a viable source of energy for them in the future. I don't know why, but they are paying for dark energy studies as well. So it's an excellent name for, for something we don't know. So why large-scale surveys? Now I'm comparing the CMB pros and cons with the CMB. So CMB provides an incredibly detailed picture of the universe when it was still in a very early state of its evolution. So the universe was very simple when the CMB was created, which means everything was linear, small perturbations, easy, uh, and that's good. Uh, but we have to remember that we only have one CMB. We have only the CMB at one redshift. We don't have the CMB at different redshifts. So this is only a snapshot of how the universe looked at redshifts 1100. For example, if you want to study dark energy, this is almost useless, because the dark energy fraction of the universe at these high redshifts was really, really small. So fractions, fractions uh, of a percentage. It had no contribution to the expansion history of the universe at that redshift. Today, it's a dominant component. In high redshift, it was very small. So large scale surveys, pros and cons. Unlike CMB measurements, galaxy surveys provide a view of the evolution of the entire galaxy population for a long period of time, 10 billion years. And dark energy, if you're interested in dark energy, many, many people are interested in dark energy, this started dominating the energy budget of the universe relatively recently, maybe redshift 0.7, so not that long ago. About 5 billion years ago, dark energy became a dominant source of energy in the universe. So if you want to study the evolution of dark energy, galaxy surveys are indispensable. But now comes the, uh, the, the con, and it depends on who you ask. So cosmologists, pure cosmologists, which we also have here in Helsinki, are not happy with this because the measurements involve messy astrophysics. So the worst kind of dirty astrophysics. Star formation, black holes, stellar evolution, supernova explosions, all kinds of things that are very nonlinear and very complicated. So CMB does not involve that. CMB is very simple, easy physics. So here you really need to have a detailed understanding of astrophysical processes. You need to understand how galaxies form and evolve. For astro astro astronomers, this of course is a pro. This is not a con. That's exactly what we are interested in. Then some of the applications. What can you do with these large scale surveys? I will give you only three or four examples here. The first thing is something called bionic acoustic oscillations. So the, the scale of the CMB, we saw this first peak in the CMB, this at one, one degree, this very strong compression of matter, and this will also be seen in the galaxy population later on. This same scale will be, remain there. So when you look at galaxies, so this is correlation function saying how probable it's for you to see another galaxy at a certain distance from your galaxy. Then you see at, uh, at distance 100 megaparsecs, you see more galaxies than you would su suggest randomly. So there's an over-density of galaxies at this distance. And this is the same peak we saw, but now being expanded by redshift. And, and here are different models. And if you assume that there's no variance, then you should see this line. And clearly, there is a peak with the data. So this is also seen by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. This was the first detection. And the key thing here is that this scale is, again, it's a measuring rod. We know how large this scale is. But now, instead of the CMB, we can put this at different redshifts. We know we have a one meter stick. Let's look how big it looks on the sky at different redshifts. This will tell us about the geometry and, and cosmological parameters of, of the universe. So this is a key thing. The same as the CMB, but now we have the CMB at infinite redshifts. Not at infinite, but, but at several different redshifts, instead of just one. But this effect will be much weaker. Why is this effect weaker than the one in the CMB? The reason is that the galaxies are dark matter dominant. Variance are a fraction of a galaxy mass, but most of the mass in the galaxy is dark matter. Dark matter did not take part in these fluctuations. This was pure variance. So that's why this effect is much weaker than the CMB. And you need big statistics, uh, uh, you need uh, good accuracy, and lots of galaxies to find this and see it clear. But this is a very powerful technique for, for cosmology. Because you can, if you have a large enough galaxy sample, you can do this very clearly. Uh, so it's similar to the CMB, but now we have different redshifts. And from this, we saw the relationship between redshift and distance. This will allow us to study the evolution of dark energy as a function of redshift, the geometry of the universe, the cosmological parameters. Next thing, weak gravitational lensing. So what is this? This is some kind of NASA illust illustration of that. But you remember when a galaxy light comes from far away, it goes past all the structures in between. This will all deflect the light slightly. So what that means, if you measure the correlations and shapes 
of 1.5 billion galaxies. You can from this then deduce, Euclid can do this, the expansion and growth history of the universe can be deduced from this. So you can get a, a structure of the growth of the structure and also a map of the total mass distribution in the universe. Not the visible matter, the dark matter as well. Because visible matter and dark matter both bend light in the same way. They're both gravitationally doing this. So the weak lens and gravitational potential of intervening structures perturbs the path of photons ever so slightly, and the amplitude of distortion provides a direct measure of gravitational field and a map of the total matter distribution directly. And in order to do this well, it's not enough, because this is a statistical effect. If you measure the weak lensing of five galaxies, you don't see anything. You need millions of galaxies, or hundreds of thousands of these. And you need lots of galaxies, and also you need a high spatial resolution, because you have to see the shapes of galaxies. And if you look at the shapes of galaxies on the ground, they're usually blurred by the atmosphere, and it's difficult to see. Them. Then, next probe, clusters of galaxies. This is also important because clusters of galaxies are the most massive structures in the universe, and it can also be used as cosmological uh, probes. And the key, the key thing here is that galaxy clusters probe sensitive with the exponential day of the primordial spectrum density perturbations. Uh, and you can see, basically, you look for the most massive structures in the universe, and you see how many galaxies of a given mass do we have in this volume. Is this possible given our cosmological model? That, that's, that's the simple thing you do. And then finally, supernova 1A. We should not forget the supernovae because that's the way we first found the dark energy. So supernova 1A are important because the idea is that you have white dwarf. It explodes always at the same mass, although this has now slightly been challenged if this is really true. But the idea is if you have a standard candle, which is always equally bright, measuring its apparent brightness at different distances gives, gives you the cosmological model. So this is how supernova is done. And they can be ma good, made good standard candles because this is actually a plot of different supernovae that their uh, luminosity as a function of decay time. And actually, this is something a little bit dangerous. You have to apply an empirical stretch factor to make all the supernova agree with each other. And after that, if you take into account that, then they can be very good standard candles. A bit dangerous, seems to work. At least the Nobel Prize Committee believes it, and then they gave the prize 2011. Finally, combination of data sets. This is very, very important. So you can combine <coughs> the data sets. Uh, always in cosmology, you need several data sets to know what you're really doing. So this is dark energy, dark matter. You have supernova measurements, you have CMP, you have clusters. And if they all overlap in a point, that gives you some credibility that what you're doing, if they would be all over the place, that would be not good. The same here for dark energy. This gives you the dark energy equation of state parameter. So if it's minus one, it, it's uh, vacuum energy, then it's the normal vacuum energy. And it's important to combine these different cosmological data sets as they often probe complementary regions in the parameter space, and the supernova data alone would not have probably convinced the, the Nobel Committee. You need also other evidence for the dark energy, and then, then they were even to, able to convince that. And finally, for astronomers, really important thing about the galaxy survey is not just cosmology. I mean, it's interesting to know a few parameters, but it's much more interesting to know how galaxies actually form and evolve. That, that's astrophysics. And what these kind of surveys will do, they will find huge numbers of new objects. Galaxies at different redshifts, uh, uh, different types of galaxies, dwarf galaxies, but also brown dwarfs, all kinds of special stars, everything will be found with very these deep images. So this will be a complete unique data set in this sense. Uh, so it's really important to understand the legacy science. Uh, so anything from large fields of astrophysics, uh, from exoplanets to galaxies, will be, will be seen. And finally, key thing, and I've been talking about observations for far too long than normally, is the key thing to really understand what we need to be doing. We also need to do theory. So this is more advertisement from my group. So we run numerical simulations, because to interpret and understand the observations, we need input from theoretical astrophysics or numerical simulation. So this is animation showing evolution of a big cosmological box, 100 megaparsec dark matter structure. And here actually is a movie about the formation of a, the very first supermassive black holes early on in the universe. Uh, so the theoretical aspect is also important. And, and what's going to happen with these observational data sets is that they're going to push the theories, the, the theoreticians to their limits. Because before you were able to get away with almost murder, the data was so bad, so almost any theoretical model would fit. That's not true anymore. It's getting increasingly more difficult to do these models because you're really constrained by observational data. Okay, I think I'm out of time, so I'll summarize. 
So the thing to remember here is what Planck found so far, emphasize word so far, because uh, we don't know what the final result from Planck is. Uh, some people know here in Helsinki, but they won't, they won't tell you even if you try. So there's very strong evidence for the support of the standard lambda CDM model from the first data release. Then we have the BICEP2 mission, which seems or claims detection of primordial gravitational waves. This would be also the first indication of quantum gravity, because this tells you that, although we don't know what the theory is, it tells us that the theory of quantum gravity must exist, because this is quantum fluctuations in the gravitational metric in the early universe. So it is quite uh, astounding. So if the detection stands, uh, what most probably will happen is the detection will go down slightly, but it's still there. So, so that's what most people seem to think. So if true, this would be a revolution in modern cosmology. Cosmology was saying this is equivalent of finding life on other planets and so on. I don't, I'm not sure if it's, but for cosmologists, it might, might be as revolutionary, but, but it's still a very important detection. But you still have to understand the foreground. So the devil is really in the details. How is the foreground polarization affecting this? And Planck will tell us more about this. And the future for observational cosmology really lies in these large-scale galaxy surveys. So they are already ongoing, but the most important of these will be the space-based galaxy surveys. So Euclid, which will be able to probe <coughs> the evolution of the galactic population for the past 10 billion years, and it's very important uh, measurements in astrophysical, uh, the important measurements are astrophysical in nature. This is important to remember. They're not simple measurements of CNB peaks, they're astrophysical. So we need to understand the astronomy and astrophysical aspects very well. Okay, I'll stop here, thank you. There's a plot about the, cor the correlation, autocorrelation of the galaxies and uh, with this baryonic acoustic oscillation peak at 100 megaparsec. Uh, yeah. And I'm puzzled. All the, your models somehow go wrong. They, none of this really. You mean these the different models? Yeah. Yeah, because they have sort of their own slope, because these black points are sort of more flat, and you have these bumps in all the models at 30 megaparsecs actually, at lower, at lower distance. Ah, here already. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they are sort of all have wrong shape. Is it something with my eyes, or it's actually... It's part of your eyes, but probably also the data. So, that's a good, I mean, I was, I was trying to draw your attention to this bump, <laughs> and ignore, ignore this point, but it's true. This is Sloan still, so there's of course lots of, I mean, it's ground-based, uh, magnitude errors correlations, and, and there are this is not 100%, it's slightly disputed by some people who think that is this really the real detection. But the majority s seem to think, I mean at least the, the point here is that the red line, or what, what color this really is, here completely fails the data. And this would be a non-baryon model, so yeah. a baryon zero model. So clearly there's some hints of that. I mean, uh, it seems that there is a bump of 100 megaparsecs. Yes. But that it seems that below 100 there is just a wrong shape. Um, the shape is different from the models. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Sort of, um, but yeah, you know, error bars la large enough. I agree. I mean, it's it's this is a detection paper from Eisenstein's Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So maybe uh, the more recent results maybe show it better. But I think uh, I, the bump here seems to be there. So, I, I, but still, might be some. But theoretically, you can't make the, this flat. Yeah. You need. You always have this 30, 20 megaparsec bump. In the yeah, I, I think the only only thing that varied here is the baryon fraction in this model. So, so this is also uh, the other cosmological parameters might have been wrong because it's an old paper. So you will see there may be also varying omega matter, omega lambda might change this slab as well. I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm not really done this bit. Other questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. If, if, if you have magnetic field in the primordial plus in the CMB plasma, would that generate this B mode polarization? Or how, how large is magnetic field? So the B mode polaris, the B mode polarization that's detected is, is not really generated in the CMB. The idea is generated yes, in inflation. Yes, I know, but I'm asking that if you have, how large magnetic field would you require in the plasma? In the I, think, I think it has to be quite, quite. Um, large. I, I don't think it's really a realistic model. I have not really heard this mentioned. And it's difficult to understand how you would get strong magnetic fields so early. I don't know, but mm -hmm. maybe. But, but this is not really an option I have heard at least yeah. mentioned. Give us, uh, just for fun, your, your gut feeling. Do you think the spice of two results will go away? Well, I don't think it will. I mean, the result stands, they've seen something, but if it's cosmological origin, that's, uh, that's, yeah, I know you know that. Uh, I, my gut feeling is it will go down. I mean, not away, but down. 
Uh, uh, it will go definitely down from 0.2 because this is almost a ridiculously la la a large number. And they actually state that this is a number with no foreground uh, I mean, reduction at all. So that's not really a realistic number, but many people jump on this. So it will go down, but maybe something between, uh, that's a good question, 0 0.05 to 0 0.1, but it might also go away completely. I'm a little bit torn. And of course, if it goes away completely, then this is not good for the science of cosmology because the way it was published, I mean, it was really hyped, hyped well, like. Well, it was not published. I mean. It's not published. Yeah, you have to remember, it's of course only a submitted paper on, on the archive. It has not been refereed, and and actually, many people say that with the current background analysis, it will never pass the referee unless it's from Harvard. It will never pass a Princeton referee. Let's say that <laughs> maybe ever. Or a Planck referee. A Planck referee as well. So Planck, we have to wait, but of course the Americans, you know, they want to hijack the situation now with this result, and Planck, they were a little bit unhappy faces, but maybe they will make a comeback. It's not so important uh, uh, who's first, uh, as long as you get it right, then finally, I think that's the key thing. But it's exciting times. Yeah. Um, a little bit reading between your lines, you had sort of commentaries of uh, whether data should be public, uh, how should it be hidden. Uh, mm -hmm. Could you elaborate uh, your opinion? How should we deal with the data rights and reduction with the big surveys? Would you make it just directly public like the Sloan did? Or? Yeah, if you make it, yeah, Sloan did that. They made it directly public. Usually, uh, in this, in the people involved in the survey still, even if you made it directly public, they still have an advantage because they know the data the best. But uh, if the data is really, really great, it's a bit dangerous maybe to make it directly public because, mm -hmm. because then you can have many, many people working on it than if you, if you want it out. But at least, I mean, usually big telescopes have this one year period that that might be something. But if you want the maximum scientific input, output, then making it public, public directly would probably be the best option. But if I, I may, many ways. if I may comment on that, you can see the results of the uh, two different policies taken by NASA and the European Space Agency. And the number of citations and the number of publications is favored by the NASA Open Data Policy by factors uh, that go in powers of 10 by far. So I would definitely recommend that Europe also take a more open view and have all the bright minds looking at the great data <coughs> rather than saving it for the few. We have in uh, Gaia no data rights. Mm. Nobody has data rights. It will be public as ready. It's great to hear. But an example here, when Planck made some of the first press releases, uh, just publicity image, they had to reduce the resolution of the publicity image because they were afraid that someone would go there on, on the, <laughs> and, and make cosmological analysis on the, anali the publicity image published in the newspaper. So this is, at least the CMB community, it's, it's very, very tough competition. So they've done it, uh, they reduced the resolution of the image. Still another question? No, no. Could I see again the, the picture position uh, data? You mean the bicep two? Yeah. Let's get there. Yeah, this one. Yeah. Which one? I have a similar comment as, as Yuri's, I mean, uh, uh, it, the, the polar bear data is completely the model and is anyone yeah, the worried about that? So the, so the polar bear data here, this is much older data. This is from 10 years ago. And, and they are the ones who found that uh, uh, this is not the primordial B mode. This is something happening lensing. It's not cosmological. This is much less exciting. So, so the bicep data here, but even if you look here, it's really nice. But then these points, yes, exactly. these points are not there. And, and if you look, just even knowing nothing about it, you look at this, and you think of the model, and the model barely hits any of them, well, it hits a few of the points, but many of them are completely off. So, so many people have commented that they're very worried about this, this, this plot here. And there's even a discussion of leakage of E polarization into the B, B polarization mode, so it's mental issues. But they seem to claim that everything is fine. But there were some rumors saying that they already acknowledged defeat, and they're ad admitting that they've done something, but that's not true either. So rumors are flying. So depends on if you and Howard or Princeton what to say here. Or, or Planck. 